Rob, are we live? Yes, we are. All right. Well, uh, welcome, everybody. Thanks for uh, joining us at the uh, SAME Energy and Sustainability Community of Interest webinar for uh, September. I think we have a good program set up for you today. Uh, my name is Matt McCann. I'm a retired Navy Civil Engineer Corps officer, and I currently work for uh, AECOM and our Energy Services Group. Um, I'll be managing the uh, Energy and Sustainable uh, Sustainability COI program for the, for the rest of the year and through 2022. So you can expect to see my face uh, moderating a lot of the sessions that we that we have uh, coming up. Um, can you go to the yeah? So you should see a membership survey coming out. Um, soon in October. Uh, we want, want, really want to hear what uh, suggestions you have, and especially with regard to what our webinar program is going to look like um, in, in FY22. Um, I think it's especially important this time because of the, the changes in uh, administration priorities and executive orders and federal goals. Um, and of course, the what should be a massive influx of, of funding um, to, to support energy and sustainability and climate change and resilience uh, with, the, uh, with the infrastructure bills. So I think that there's a real opportunity to jump into some new and interesting topics for the, uh, for the 22 um, webinar program. And of course, we're always looking for volunteers uh, to, to help out um, and, and any aspect of, the, of the, managing the COI whether it's webinars or um, outreach or any uh, anything else, if you're interested in volunteering and being uh, participating in the COI, we will find uh, something for you to do on there. So please reach out to uh, Michelle. Um, so we're going to kick off the main event here with a poll. Rob, if you could um, open up that poll. So we just like to always understand who's um, who's out there um, joining us and uh, and participating uh, in in these events. Um, and I'll also just say that um, if you have questions, we should have time uh, ten minutes or so at the at the very least for Q and A at the at the end of the program. Um, so please post your questions in the Q&A tab, not in the chat tab, but in the, in the Q&A tab. Um, and you should be able to download the, the presentation from the, from the handouts um, tab there on your, um, on your toolbar. So do we, do we have uh, results of that poll at this point, Rob? We do, Matt. You can go to the Q&A open tab. So far, uh, zero active duty, civilian, one civilian. Three from small business, five from medium businesses, five from large businesses, and one academic or nonprofit. Great, thanks for that. All right, so I am gonna turn it over to, uh, to the, the speaker today here. Um, his name is Bob Knadler. He's a vice president with Hanson Professional Services, a national uh, consulting engineering firm. He has experience with both uh, mechanical and electrical building systems um, and is a past president of the Energy Management Association. Uh, he speaks regularly on these types of topics, including commissioning, energy management, resilience. Um, like many of us, Bob has spent a, a lot of time uh, working from home recently, which includes for him watching the elk parade his parade across his lawn uh, in the mountains of, of Western North Carolina. So we won't get him started on that topic because we wouldn't have any time for, for resilience. Um, okay. Over to you, Bob, to, uh, to talk, talk about that. Uh, okay. Well, thank you, Matt. I appreciate, appreciate the opportunity today to, uh, to talk to the group again about energy resiliency, uh, really resiliency in, in general. And just to, to start out, I think everybody would agree that over the last couple of years, there's been a lot of challenges. Uh, in a lot of different areas, uh, infrastructure, facilities, et cetera. And I wanna talk a little bit today about the importance and why it really takes a team uh, with various expertise and various experience in terms of tackling uh, some of those issues, really from the planning all the way through uh, final acceptance and going forward. So we'll start out by talking a little bit about definitions and what is resiliency? Well, the ability of systems I mean, this is the, the classical definition to anticipate, resist, absorb, respond, adapt, recover from a disturbance. That's different than reliability. You know, with reliability, you're really looking for a system or component to function as it was designed. You know, how we want it to perform as it was supposed to for, you know, whatever period of time we need it to. 
And then energy security is really something that the Department of Defense uses quite a bit to make sure that they've got reliable supplies of energy uh, to meet whatever their mission is, you know, going forward. So one of the things I want to stress right up front is that resilience is not a static state. It really is uh, an evolving set of challenges. And we'll talk a little bit about that as we go through today. And the fact that, as you can see in these couple of quotes here from these uh, presidential directive and also the DOD, the ability to prepare and adapt for changing conditions. And then of course, to withstand and recover. Uh, it's really, really important to understand, you know, whatever the uh, threat, whatever the challenge is, that you've got the capability uh, to mitigate that. And that's part of what the planning up front is as you go through this. And again, resilience is something that you can deal with in terms of infrastructure, in terms of facilities, uh, and even communities. And that's one of the focuses that a lot of people have going forward today. And so what are some of those risks that are out there? Well, obviously the first one you see on the left, uh, we know over the last two years with respect to the COVID-19 pandemic, but you've also got natural disasters such as floods and hurricanes. Um, we've seen what's happened just, you know, with the wildfires in California over the last several years, uh, the couple of hurricanes that have hit recently with Ida and Nicholas, terrorism and, and what it can do both physically and uh, even from a cyber uh, perspective in terms of attacking various computer systems. And then the possibility for accidents or, or human error that could be brought into the equation. And what areas then need to be addressed in mitigating those risks? Well, obviously your utility systems and your infrastructure. Obviously you have to look at the facilities, how they're designed from a physical perspective to, to basically thwart any kind of potential disaster or attack that may be coming their way. Security in buildings, various systems that, particularly systems that run on energy, and then obviously technology and life safety systems. Those are all very important going forward. I mean, with respect to hazards and damage, this little matrix here kind of shows a lot of the primary hazards on the left side. And, and it, you can see it deals with the pandemics, it deals with weather, it deals with uh, th other threats. And then across the top, it kind of shows you what the disruptions or what the disaster uh, consequences may be from those various hazards. And you can see it, it really crosses anything from structural damage, uh, you know, outages for uh, power, communications, uh, protect, potential economic disruptions, and so on and so forth. And so it's really critical that those all get evaluated as you're going through the planning stage of your project. You know, here's a slide where I just talk a little bit about modern day incidents. And you'll see here, the first one deals with the pandemic. The second two deal with obviously weather, you know, um, the tornadoes and the wildfires. The next two after that deal with basically terrorist threats. And then you've got actually what was determined to be a, um, an accident with respect to the Amtrak derailment. And then obviously there's a lot of cyber attacks. We'll talk a little bit more about that when we talk about utilities shortly. So one of the things they do up front is risk, and you're trying to evaluate risk. You know, uh, part of resiliency and reliability is risk management, risk assessment. So one of the things you look at is what are the various hazards that your particular infrastructure, facility, community might see? What are those threats? What's the vulnerability? You know, are if you've got a facility that's built on the coast or in a highly susceptible area to the weather, um, are you in a location where from a power, you've got maybe a non-dependable uh, power supply, it hasn't really been looped. Uh, and then what's your capacity to cope? Okay, in other words, and, and again, as you design your systems with a greater capacity to cope and mitigate, that risk goes down. If you don't have the capacity to cope, if it's very little, then you can see that the risk will go up. And that's what's really important here. I wanna stress that, you know, when we add in resiliency, you know, a lot of the buzzwords in the 80s and 90s dealt with energy efficiency, and then we moved into sustainability and environmental ecological 
uh, concerns. But we need to add we need to add resiliency. We need to add reliability, and we've got to look for that synergy. We've got to look at you know taking all of these together and evaluating them. And it really requires, as I say in the bottom there, a team with diverse ex expertise and experience. You know, one of the things, as with any process, you know, in, in a lot of the things that we do, whether it's design, construct, it's, it's almost an iterative process that you learn and adapt as you go through it. And it comes back to what I call lessons learned. You know, this particular wheel that you have here, which was developed by the national labs, as you can see, define what those resilience goals are. It gets back to defining what the risk is and then walking through, characterize what those hazards are, collect the data, you know, calculate what the consequences might be. And then over time, you're gonna learn and adapt in, again, a lot of the things that we see today in terms of uh, new materials, in terms of different systems have come from that analysis and what I call that iterative process. So I wanna talk a little bit today about critical infrastructures. Uh, we're gonna focus more on energy and you'll see why in a second. Uh, actually, the USA's had a critical infrastructure program since 1996, but it really got codified in the Patriot Act of 2001. And what they did is they've identified 16 critical infrastructure sectors. And as you see in the red text in the middle, it's really assets and systems, which by their very nature could have, a, if they were interrupted or destroyed, would have a debilitating impact on the security, economic security and public health or safety of the citizens of the United States. So what are those 16? Well, the first eight, are listed on this slide. You can see it deals with the with the economy. It goes through, deals with physical facilities, communications. Uh, it gets down into emergency services. The next data are on the next slide, and you can see at the top, and I've, I've bolded in red, energy. And it was actually identified that it is the most critical of the 16, and why? Because the other 15, depend upon energy. It's absolutely critical for all the other 15. So where are we with respect to energy? Well, again, some of the conservative estimates that poor reliability and power in the US cost various corporations, cost the US economy 79 billion a year and poor performance over 100 billion a year. But what's really kind of striking is that reliability in many ways with the various interruptions is worse in the US than in some of the other developed countries of the world. And the last item we're gonna talk about in a second is what I see as the convergence or what I call the mega infrastructure. And that's where we're looking at energy, communications, data, and commerce. So I mentioned starting out about it's not a static state when you're evaluating resiliency. It's, it, there's evol evolving challenges. And we see that in terms of climate change with the extreme weather. You think about earlier this year with that cold freeze that came down into Texas. Uh, we see urbanization, a concentration of a lot of people moving into cities, increasing the risk you know, for, for various interruptions or, or even health concerns, the importance of electricity because of all the energy that's growing out there, electricity is growing the fastest right now. Uh, flexibility and planning. Uh, one of the things driving electricity, actually the three things that are driving electricity in the US right now, as an aside here, are electric vehicles. This is what's forecast over the next five to 10 years data centers and electronic commerce, and I don't think anybody would be surprised by that. But the third thing is cannabis production. Cannabis production takes a tremendous amount of, of electricity. Uh, in, in other areas of the world, the thing that drives electricity is uh, the adoption of a lot of HVAC systems in areas that have not had that before. Flexibility and planning, we all know that a lot of buildings were vacant over the last couple of years, uh, particularly commercial office buildings. And then 
again, talking a little bit about this, what I call the mega infrastructure. And what I'm talking about there is the fact that between the generation and delivery systems, telecom, transportation, the internet, and electronic commerce, they all have a reliance on one another, a, a deep reliance on one another. And besides what we call the smart grid or the internet of things, you can add in there AI now as well. And the fact that if there's a disruption in any one of those, it's going to have a significant effect on the others. It could have what, what some people may call, you know, more of a ripple effect. Again, there's a lot of metrics out there that utility companies use to evaluate their interruptions, how frequent, how long, what effect it has on the customer. And obviously, a lot of these things could be mitigated, could be addressed but there's that cost benefit factor that has to be evaluated as they look at it. So again, potential disruptions. I've talked about a couple of these in terms of natural disasters attacks, but I wanna talk a little bit further about component failures and aging infrastructure, particularly with respect to the electrical grid. Um, I mentioned a second ago about interdependencies and the potential for cascading outages. Uh, on the generation side, you've got vulnerabilities in terms of the fuels and their delivery being interrupted in some way. I, if you look at the fourth bullet, whether you're, you realize it or not, um, the Lake Orwell hydroelectric plant in California was shut down in the early part of August due to the drought and its inability to keep operating. So again, the, we've got to take a look and, and, and decide, you know, how can these things be addressed in terms of some sort of reliable uh, redundancy or backup situation? I mentioned about aging infrastructure. Well, the American Society of Civil Engineers issues a, a, what they call an infrastructure report card every couple of years. And in 2021, and they look at specifically different areas, including water, wastewater, and electricity, the electric grid. The report card classified the grid in the US as a C minus. It was a D plus in 2017. So it's improved a little bit with some additional, uh, what I call investment by the utility companies in some of their distribution centers. But again, Take a look at these bullets that most transmission distribution lines were constructed in the 50s and 60s with a 50 year life expectancy. There's over 640,000 miles of high voltage transmission lines in the 48 states that are at full capacity. And the amount of money it would take now to replace the grid and power plants, these, are, this, these numbers are a couple years old, is well over $5 trillion at this point. So, you know, we talk about this infrastructure bill and it's really looking to address a lot of different areas of, you know, from roads to bridges to, again, addressing a lot of different areas. But that alone gives you an idea of what, what we're facing in terms of infrastructure. So the four pillars for enhancing grid resilience, distributing generation, in other words, the use of microgrids or combined heat and power plants, uh, smartening the grid, hardening the grid, and then building some sort of resilience on demand. And this is really the four pillars that the utility companies are looking at now. Strategies, managing the risk. And again, this gets back to that early assessment, that preparation, you know, for response planning and readiness, you know, strengthening. A lot of people say, well, why don't you run distribution lines underground? It can be done, it is done in, in areas that are maybe highly susceptible, but you have to take a look at what the cost is. It, in many areas, the cost is at least four to five times as much as it is to run them overhead. Increase system flexibility where you can loop the line so there's two different paths if one is interrupted. The use of energy storage, you're seeing a lot of advances in, in batteries now. And as I mentioned, combined heat and power plants and microgrids, we'll talk about those. Increased uh, situational awareness, visualization, utility companies are becoming 
much more astute in being able to immediately identify where there's an outage. Um, I happen to be on Duke Energy's power distribution system. And I can tell you that if I have an outage within probably less than a minute, I will get a text on my phone telling me um, that obviously my power is out, how long it, they anticipate it'll be out, how many other individuals are impacted in my immediate area. Uh, so, I mean, there's they really have a lot of advanced knowledge now. And as I see in the final bullet, data analytics, there's a lot of use of fault detection and diagnostics now to try to improve their response time and try to mitigate any kind of uh, disasters with respect to interruptions. So again, depending on cost assessments, pole replacement, uh, durable equipment, ro relocating lines, you know, you can also take a look at uh, other initiatives. That third bullet, inventory key replacement equipment, whether you know it or not, the large power transformers that are in a lot of the switch centers for the utility companies, those cost several million dollars and could take as many as two years to produce. So the ability to try to at least stock some of the key equipment that they have to have if there was a major disruption is important. The second bullet talks about agreements and you probably have seen these between utility companies so that if there is a natural disaster, such as a hurricane, other utilities will send crews to help re basically restore power. And these are agreements that utilities have throughout the United States. Cybersecurity, again, whether you realize it or not, um, a lot of utilities are basically have a dedicated group that do nothing but thwart different attacks that they get on a regular basis. Um, they don't advertise it. They will not typically admit it. I have, but I have talked to people in the utility industry. Uh, they have to be very, very aware. Uh, they are getting attacked on, on a very regular basis. Now, again, there's different evolutions. Hackers are getting more sophisticated. There's more attacks. But on the other hand, you're seeing uh, more microgrids being developed. You're seeing the generation being distributed out beyond just the big power plants. So it goes both ways. What's important is in the second column about the Department of Energy has some research and development efforts, particularly targeting cybersecurity for energy delivery systems. Data centers, data centers, obviously, with any, as with any mission critical facility, it's really important to evaluate, you know, what the cost is in terms of the outages. And again, the Uptime Institute evaluates data centers in terms of their design and, and their performance. And tier four is obviously um, the most critical. And as you can see in the bottom right-hand corner, 99.99% uh, site availability. Uh, they also evaluate what the severity is for any outages. And with any electronic commerce, you take a look and you see what the cost could be. And on this slide, I talk a little bit about the fact that Amazon back in 2018 had several outages in their Virginia data centers uh, over a three month period. And it included six hours during one of their prime events. And the average cost, as you see there for a data center incident outage is about three quarters of a million dollars. It's over $11,000 per minute. So you can see that the longer it's out, you could run into several million dollars. And that little equation there uh, helps to say, what are the potential revenue losses in downtime if a data center goes out? And then again, there's a higher, higher dependence in terms of electronic commerce these days, communications and so on. So, I mentioned combined heat and power plants. And again, renewable energy systems, they help re increase the resilience. Uh, as you can see there, the factors driving them are decarbonization, resilience, and economics. Uh, you know, whether you're dealing with 
uh, CHP or whether you're dealing with uh, solar PV systems, wind systems, whatever the case may be. There are some challenges in terms of keeping the grid stable and integrating the controls, but you see a lot more people looking at these as a potential solution should they lose utility power. Again, a couple of those areas are hospitals and mission critical facilities, whereas data centers previously uh, depended a lot on emergency generators. And there still are banks of emergency generators out there, but you're seeing a move now towards combined heat and power plant, fuel cells when they're available. Uh, again, combined heat and power plant, they don't necessarily run on natural gas, they could, but they can also run um, on biogas, like for example, uh, from a landfill, methane, as long as it's been cleaned, uh, biomass, uh, such as wood chips, you get the benefit of both electricity and thermal energy. Uh, so we're seeing more of that being incorporated. We're even seeing that at a campus-wide basis. We have several uh, universities that we work with that, are that have actually incorporated combined heat and power systems uh, in their central plant. Microgrids, again, I think a lot of people probably familiar, again, with microgrids, the fact that they're self-sufficient, they can serve a discrete graphic uh, geographic footprint. Again, they can contain one or more different types. I mentioned solar PV. It could also be wind turbines, or again, combined heat power generators. And a lot of them now are starting to add energy storage. Yeah, again, the battery technology has advanced to a point where you're starting to see a lot of that incorporated in some of these microgrids. Again, the ability to island. So one of the advantages is whatever your, your microgrid is, is that if there's an outage from the central utility system, the ability to island yourself away and run off of your own microgrid system, okay? And whether this is in the healthcare industry, as I mentioned, that we see it more in universities, obviously the military DOD on some of their bases. And we're also seeing a few, in some areas, a few commercial and industrial users as well. You know, the Department of Defense in their national defense strategy came out, the homeland is no longer a sanctuary. And they have their three goals there, energy resilience, security, and cost savings. And they talk about how important it is to tackle all three of those. And again, there's, there's even mandates that have been set up to try to achieve a certain percentage of renewables, reduce their consumption and demand, and even in doing that, reducing their greenhouse gas emissions. And again, uh, we talk about this with respect to the Army and, and various uh, bases, whether it's in the defense, uh, defense category, but there's other facilities as well. And those would include, for example, the State Department has the uh, Overseas Buildings Operations Group, which oversees the embassies and the consulates around the world. And a lot of those are built in such a way that they are self-sufficient. Um, between their on-site campus generators uh, and, and in many cases, uh, a supplemental uh, renewable energy system. They also have their own self-contained potable water treatment systems, wastewater treatment systems. They store water in, in large tanks. They've got their own fuel tanks. Uh, so they've got the capability of operating for an extended period of time if they lose all the utilities from their host country. The uh, Department of uh, Homeland Security, their Office of Infrastructure Protection does offer this program, Regional Resilience Assessment Program, which really helps in terms of addressing dependencies, interdependencies, and as you see at the bottom there, it helps to improve the partnerships between the public and private sector. So it, it is a resource you can go out and you can uh, address and, and contact them through the internet. So, I'll just go back for a second to just mention that one of the things that we're seeing more again is resiliency metrics. You know, one of the questions I had earlier was about qualitative versus quantitative. So one of the things you see, I think everybody's familiar with LEED and some of the work that's being done there, but in terms of resilience rating systems, performance-based versus strategic, they look at preparedness, mitigation measures during construction, 
response capabilities and recovery mechanisms. So as I mentioned, in terms of the green uh, GBCI, the Green Building Council, you take a look at the uh, lead, which they've had for a number of years in terms of evaluating cities and communities. They've also have these other three certification systems, which include RELY at the building level, SITE, and also the PEER. And these are also similar types of certification. So if you take a look at them and you say, okay, RELY is more geared towards socially and environmentally resilient design and construction. Um, in fact, about 25% of its points overlap with LEED. It's geared for emergency preparedness, adaptation, and community vitality. So, so that's one of the systems that's out there that, again, the focus is on resiliency. The second one is more aligned with land development and sustainable design. It's more for landscape architects and basically enhancing the benefits from landscapes and, and basically uh, ecologically resilient communities, as you can see there, sites. It's also in version two. And then the last one is peer. And this one's really geared as performance excellence in electricity renewal. And this one has, again, four categories of focus, as you can see there, reliability, energy efficiency, operational effectiveness, and it also has a, com a customer focus as well. So these are, these are other certifications that help establish metrics and help people during the planning stage and design stage to help them prepare and determine you know, what they're trying to achieve in terms of resilience, just like people do in terms of sustainability, in terms of energy efficiency, you've got to bring this into the mix. So one of the things I want to talk about briefly is, again, the planning and design, it's a team approach. And the fact that it requires diverse expertise. You know, we talk about a team as it relates to developing a, a, a program, whether it's a facility, a master plan or whatever, you bring the owner in and some of his staff, you bring in a design team, an architect, an engineer, maybe a sustainability or environmental consultant. You may have uh, representatives from the utility companies or various, but you also need to take a look and think about commissioning providers, energy consultants, and even IT and cybersecurity. These are really important people that have a wealth of lessons learned that can help in terms of the upfront planning and design as you go through a project. So planning attributes, again, the importance of planning, what ifs, okay? Define the anticipated facility use. If there's an emergency, are you evacuating it or is it gonna try to remain fully or partially occupied with standby systems? What's an acceptable level of disruption? Is it a few minutes? Is it a couple of hours, a day, a week? What's the required level of reliability or redundancy for the utilities? You know, we talk about, again, mission critical ones like hospitals, like data centers, in terms of having either redundant systems and or standby power systems. Well, it's important to work with a commissioning provider to develop that testing criteria. How are you going to test whether or not these systems operate like you anticipate if there is a disruption? How do you develop what we call that fault and failure testing criteria to make sure that it works. And then an energy consultant is very important to work with the utility company, particularly if you're looking at a microgrid or some other strategy, and it's got to connect into the grid in such a way that it could island if it needed to. Design attributes. Again, these are all things that need to be considered by the entire team. The location construction of the buildings you know, whether or not they're set up for passive survivability, if they did lose their environmental systems, what kind of materials do you use? Do you have manual control capability? And again, standby power and backup water. So one of the things I want to talk about, again, is the need. We talked about infrastructure, but building and facility resilience. And I want to talk about it briefly in terms of commercial facilities. 
keeping buildings open is really a prime resilience strategy, as we say here, to spur bounce back. And these statistics probably concern a lot of people, particularly after what they've seen from the pandemic pandemic over the last couple of years. 40 to 60% of small businesses never reopen after a disaster. And 90% of small businesses fail within one year if they do not reopen within five days after a disaster. So it's really important on the commercial level to incorporate this. It's not just simply for uh, mission critical, but also look at the energy efficiency, look at the resiliency, their co-benefits. And then again, re reduce complete reliance on the grid. If there's any way to have standby electrical generation, it's absolutely important or you know, some form of standby power. One of the big things that's coming up now, we've talked about this more on a facility by facility or maybe campus basis, but what they call connected communities. And this is a, this is a new initiative that uh, we see ASHRAE taking part in. Again, uh, unlocking the value and the economies of scale for, for clients and utilities versus a building by building approach. The idea is that in a community atmosphere, community setup with multiple buildings, multiple owners and customers, how can they share distributed renewable resources? Okay, so by that, what do I mean? Well, they have to have buildings that are what we would call grid interactive, efficient buildings. Grid interactive, they communicate with the grid. And there may be shared systems within that community, district thermal plants like district heating hot water or chilled water plants, community solar plants, um, large solar arrays, or maybe even large energy storage systems. So this is a new initiative. Instead of looking at it building by building or let's say campus or base, to take a look and say, okay, how can we look at a larger view of a community and you know, maybe at a local government level? Fractal grid is a, is a unique term, but what it talks about is a system of systems architecture where you really are tying together possibly multiple microgrids into a common area that can be tapped by these connected communities or your community and its group of buildings. There's a lot of challenges in this approach, and that's why it, it, you know there's uh, several groups, including ASHRAE, that are in, in investigating it now. Uh, engineering challenges, the design, the operations, and the governance. Okay, so if you're all tying into a shared resource, you know how, how is that being governed? How is it being uh, shared? Technical challenges in terms of the interoperability the cybersecurity, and even the installation of the infrastructure between all these different buildings and their shared resources. So there is a group, another group, I'm, this one is the Alliance for National and Community Resilience. It was really founded by the International Code Council the U.S. Resiliency Council and the Meridian Institute, as well as several corporate ones, including Target, BASF, and DuPont. Its objective is the development of a system of community benchmarks. Again, getting back to that metric, how do you measure resiliency? And they basically have come up with nine areas dealing with all the way from adopting various code requirements through assessing vulnerabilities and developing what we call resiliency plans. But I really wanna draw your attention to this last, last line here. The National Institute for um, uh, Building Sciences, NIBS, okay, has really done an investigation and come up and said that investments in hazards mitigation, so basically you're talking about resiliency, provide a benefit between $4 and $11 for every $1 that's invested. So it really shows that there's a good return on investment, okay, there's a good payback in investing in resiliency. 
So again, resiliency is a new norm, okay? And I I've purposely threw in the X there for commissioning because it's no longer what outage or how how long, but how disruptive and costly. And really, we believe that commissioning, energy management, and again, cybersecurity, they need to be brought in as part of the team up front in the planning. They can enhance the resiliency. You know, forward thinking groups, whether it's at a government level or, or institutional level, they're basically looking at leveraging their planning, resiliency planning as a strategic asset. And they're develop, developing resiliency plans. And they're doing that through working with teams of professional consultants. So it's really important that teams come together from the planning stage all the way through. They develop that synergy that I talked about with respect to all those different areas, reliability, resiliency, sustainability, all the, all the way through energy efficiency so that they get a balance. It's part of that owner's project requirements, basis of design as you go forward. So with that, uh, we want to go into a couple of quick polls. Uh, again, the first one is deals with ACG, the ABC Commissioning Group. Or if you're interested in learning more about commissioning authorities, commissioning provider certification, you can uh, you can vote on this. And then we have we have a second poll as well which uh, because I'm actually speaking today on behalf of both the AABC Commissioning Group and, and the Energy Management Association. And the other one is the Energy Management Association. And we have a ANSI accredited certification for energy management professionals. So if you're interested in that certification or learning more about the Energy Management Association, you know, please just submit and we will get in touch with you with respect to that. Bob, uh, thanks so much for uh, for your presentation. We uh, we covered uh, a lot, we covered a lot of area in there. I think it was really really informative, uh, but it is but it is a pretty uh, wide ranging discussion. So I think it's it's correct. Really interesting. Um, I don't see any any um, audience posted questions, but I I certainly generated a lot of questions okay. through, uh, through our sure. recent conversations and, and hearing your presentation. So. Um, I wonder, you, you had mentioned early on in the presentation that, uh, that the U.S. has increased our, our score, our infrastructure score from D plus to, to C minus recently. Um, and I think you mentioned that has some, something to do with, uh, with, with some of the improvements that the utility companies have been making. Can you go into that a little bit more? Sure. So, uh, and that is interesting, but, it, but it's actually good news. It's good news that between 2017 and and 2021, um, as far as the scoring from the American Society of Civil Engineers, they, the, their assessment of the electrical grid and distribution system moved from a D plus to a C minus. And part of that was an increase in investment. Um, the average annual investment by utility companies in their distribution systems went from uh, roughly $15.6 billion per year to about 20, I've got it here, it was about 21.9 billion. So they, they increased it by almost a third annually over the last four years. And it's been a fairly significant increase. And uh, a lot of that money was put in that, what they call that last mile uh, for distribution. Uh, I know that several utilities, and again, I have to go back to the one that I'm most familiar with, which is Duke Energy, has got a multi-year plan. It's almost, I believe, 10 years, and it's, it's well over a billion dollars of the amount of money that they're putting in to increase the reliability of their systems. So um, I think that is what has moved the uh, score slightly from a D plus to a C minus. Great, uh, thank you. Um, we do have, uh, we have a, a question here from, from David Zerba. Um, about the uh, the challenges in in adapting PV uh, to energy resiliency, and I, I have a little anecdote related to that back from from my time uh, active duty in OSD. I remember right after um, 
Superstorm Sandy, uh, the, the um, Army Assistant Secretary Catherine Hammock was touring an Army base with a large solar array. And she was asking, well, oh, well, you have the solar array, right? So you were able to maintain operations. And the, the base staff and, and the, the traveling uh, party had to explain to her that, no, this is, this is not able to, uh, to operate um, when, the, when the grid goes down. Um, so I think that's where that question is coming from. What uh, have we made any advances on that, or what, what do you have for thoughts on how to incorporate PV um, reliably into uh, resilience schemes? Well, I, I, again, it, it comes back to the design and how the the system is set up. And and when I talk about island, when I talk about the capability of being able to island, it gets back to the capability of if there is an outage with the utility company to utilize that microgrid. Now, it depends upon the systems. Uh, I mean, there are systems out there that the uh, energy created by the solar PV system is merely fed into the grid. It's fed into the utility company's grid. It, there's no separate way for it to, to, to feed directly into the customer. Because again, some of these are developed by the utility company or you know, they're, or, or they're developed by a third party. So they, they develop them with the intent to sell the power, okay? Now, I don't know about the system you're talking about, but obviously, if, you're, if, you, if the intent was to build a microgrid that had the capability to island and serve the, the base, the facility that it was on, then that should have been designed in. Again, with solar PV, you have to understand that obviously, at night, you're not going to be generating any power if you have a couple of cloudy days. And so that's why you're starting to see this big push. If you do have some of these uh, microgrids, these solar PV systems, to add the batteries, add that storage component so that you it can carry you through when there's no generation on the system. But it is... it. It, it, one of the challenges in these microgrids is the capability of integrating them into a larger utility company uh, system and being able to, you know, whether you're fe back feeding into the utility grid or whether you're trying to, um, to use it. I, we've done several projects. We did one of the first schools here in, in, in North Carolina where uh, they had an agreement it was uh, a net zero school and a part of the power created fed into the utility grid. The other part helped serve some of the power for the school. So there's, there's a lot of technical challenges. I can't go into them all today, but that's part of my answer. Yeah. And the, the follow on question there is, is kind of how do you, how do you manage um, that? Are we getting pushback or how, how are utilities kind of understanding that, uh, that, that, how interconnection agreements are changing and, and kind of have to have to adapt to the two-way flow or, or at least being able to operate uh, more more sites being able to operate the, in island. Yeah, they, they, yeah, there's um, every, I will tell you this, it, with the utilities I'm familiar with, they all handle it a little bit differently in the way that they do agreements. It depends upon um, the location. It depends upon the customer. Um, there are some that, uh, there, there's what they call buy all sell all agreements in which you whatever you generate goes into the grid you you sell it to the utility company whatever you need you buy from the utility company so that's that's the way it's set up now in many cases what they pay you for power is less than what you're paying them for power okay but but you know that that's why and and again solar PV systems are a little bit different than, than some of the other things we're talking about. Like, let's go back to the combined heat and power system. Okay. So if you had a combined heat and power system where you had generators such that, you know, you were using the, the, um, the waste heat. Okay. Uh, from a thermal standpoint, you needed the hot water. And then you were also using the electricity. Uh, a lot of these, I mean, they are, contained and they serve the customer or the client where they're located okay so that's one of the things you have to take a look at right 
So I, I wanted to dig into something that I think is really interesting. So you talked about the, the NIBS um, analysis that identified four to eleven dollars um, value for every dollar invested in, um, I guess I, I, I guess generally resilience. Um, but I think the, where I wanted to go with that was um, there's a lot of third party finance projects within the DoD and federal um, federal government called ESPCs where you're right. relying on the savings um, generated by the investment or the, the infrastructure upgrade to pay for that investment over time. Um, the challenge has has been um, over the last few years as DoD is more and more interested in resilience of this um, of this idea. The resilience benefits, and a lot of and a lot of times, only pay back if an event happens. So, how do you kind of leverage that analysis by NIBS in a way that's going to uh, resonate or, or actually generate real dollar savings that can be applied to paying back a, a loan on a third-party finance infrastructure project? Well, I think that I think that's going to be difficult, and um, you know, I I don't know all of the assessment that went into the NIBS. Uh, calculation there. I think obviously part of it was probably uh, the ability of, of not having an outage and uh, basically calculating uh, the lack of a loss of income, the lack of a loss of, of revenue over a period of time. Okay. So they, they probably took uh, the elimination of that loss versus what, you know, what, what was spent you know, in terms of investment. But I understand where you're coming from. Again, it, a lot of the militaries have used DSPs to, to generate um, microgrids, you know, thir again, third party investment uh, on their basis to, to comply with two uh, mandates. The one mandate, as you said, to increase their resilience. The other one is to move into renewable systems, which basically will uh, drive down their greenhouse gas emissions and hopefully will improve their energy efficiency. Okay, uh, and that's one of the things you you know that they want to take a look at um, whether or not they would get the whether or not you get payback from the resilience if you don't have that interruption if you if you don't see the benefit of that resilience you know, we'd have to just take a look and see i mean obviously if you're running if you're running on a on a grid that you've invested in in other words you're you're your own generator you're generating your own power that means you're not buying power from a third party so there's got to be some sort of a savings there there's right. got to be a savings in that. Okay. Yeah. I, I, think that, I, I think that's really like that. I think as a community, we really need to figure out how to crack that nut of, of, of turning that, you know, that NIBS analysis into something that can be reliably used in a third party financing project to, to really uh, be able to guarantee savings. But you, you had also, Oh, so go, sorry, go ahead. Well, the other comment you, you we had talked about this the other day was about uh, CHP and some of the advantages. Well, anytime you can generate power at your site, whether it's through a combined heat and power plant, uh, whether it's through generators, whether it's through um, uh, a microgrid with solar PV, you don't incur the losses, the, the distribution transmission losses that you typically see from a utility company. So, so if you're generating on site, the cost of, of, of that power is typically less than the cost of buying it from a third party utility company that's generating it at some distance away and, and transmitting it to you. So that's one of the things to consider about. There's typically a savings right there if you can generate on site. And that gets back, if you think about that energy use index EUI, the source and site, and you always pay you know, if you think about what I'm talking about here, you always pay a premium for source because it's always going to be a higher number, it, you know, due to the, the transmission of the power. And, to, and that's usually a lot of times in a multiplier, if it's electricity, of almost three. It's almost a three multiplier. It, that's, mm -hmm. it, that, that's what would hit your EUI, which is a measure of BTUH, KBTUH per square foot. Yeah, but you brought up CHP too, which I think the other interesting aspect, and you also mentioned mandates, which I think is a perfect kind of segue into what I think is the last the last question here. And it, it's 
it's probably bigger than we'll be able to answer on this, but maybe the topic of a future future webinar. But of course, all the mandates and priorities coming out of the um, administration right now are focused on decarbonization and reducing greenhouse gas and um, and and climate change aspects. And you know, some some of those um, resilience aspects that you talked about, like CHP, are not necessarily uh, driving towards that that goal of decarbonization um, from an overall. I feel I realize there may be some kind of incremental improvements of using natural gas versus diesel. But what are, what are your thoughts on on kind of the, the direction it, of accomplishing? It, well, you know. It, yeah, actually, you, you bring up a good question, and, and this is some of the things that are out there. As I mentioned earlier, um, when you look at fuel cells and you look at CHP, for example, and it, yeah, natural gas is one source, but there's also biogas, as I mentioned. You know, if you could get the methane, it, it's got to be clean, but off of like a landfill. Uh, there's people out there looking at food waste now and the generation of biogas through that. There's people using biomass biomass meaning wood chips where they burn wood chips and they get the benefit again both of heat and of electricity but then i've read articles where people argue against that because what it does to the environment in order to create the wood chips you know you're cutting down trees and so from an ecological perspective they're saying what's that balance so i i, I guess what i'd say matt is it, it it really is a topic for a future <laughs> for a future presentation. And um, I, I know that I don't have the answers to all that. I've read a lot of papers where people say that they have the pros and cons. Uh, I think that uh, it gets back to that balance we were talking about, energy efficiency, sustainability, resiliency, reliability, and you know, what's the best path forward, you know? Yeah, I, I, uh, I, I, I'm, uh, I agree. I think there's a there's a, a, a vast um, there's some some really interesting stuff to mine there for for a future webinar. Uh, and I really appreciate Bob. I want to thank you for for coming on. Um, I feel like it was a really uh, fun conversation. Um, and uh, and and um, I, like I said, I really okay. appreciate you uh, participating here. Okay. I'm going to close out. I know it's going to it's going to stop in just a couple minutes. Um, okay. I just want to close out for uh, for our attendees. Um, the next webinar is going to be we're going to combine uh, with the resilience um, COI to have a topic um, that's that's going to be presented by Idaho National Lab. So more details on that to follow. It's probably going to be later um, in in October, so it might be a little bit more than a, a month from now. But that should be um, a really interesting. Uh, topic as well. Um, and then I just want to put in a plug for um, the SME Small Business Conference. Registration is open right now. It's in it's in November um, in Atlanta, and there will be an in-person meeting of the of the COI um, on the morning of the of the Tuesday there. So thank you, everybody who who participated and called in. Uh, thank you again, Bob, for uh, okay. for your insights. And um, thank you, man. Thank you. We'll see you on the next webinar. Okay.